thank you so much for joining the symposium today. Um, first off, to introduce the symposium, we have Gareth Parry, um, a chair at PK Porcano. Over to you, Gareth. Thank you, Alice. Uh, well, it's my pleasure to be able to welcome everyone to this symposium. It's a, 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 a new event for us and a new event and a new project. So I'll give you a little bit of the history of the project to start off with. In 2019, PK Portcurno Museum of Global Communication was awarded an Arts Council England grant from the Designated Collections Development Fund to create a searchable online database of our collections, museum collections, and of the archive at Port Kernel. And a parallel programme of engagement was planned, working with Anwar Akta, director of the Somoza, who we'll hear more from later during the symposium. The idea was that we would deliver student residences based at Port Kernel with the remit of exploring emerging themes within the collection and then share findings via vlogs and blogs. Well, of course, as we all know, the COVID-19 crisis made it necessary to change all this, adjust the original plans around engagement and to undertake a more remote approach as social distancing meant that to provide student residences at Port Kerner would be difficult. However, the remote approach offered new opportunities and the engagement project that we're going to hear about today emerged into a new ambitious international project. Something that was very exciting. It was going to take us down paths that we hadn't followed previously at Port Kerno, and we wanted it to be an opportunity for different academic disciplines to explore, explore our collections and history, resulting in different approaches and different questions that we may not have researched up until this time. For example, we wanted to explore ideas regarding decolonization of collections, alternative histories of the communities impacted and formed around the arrival of international telegraph cables. Well, we made a start. We recruited Alice, Alice Howard, who you'll get to know quite well during the symposium. Uh, Alice, a postgraduate student at Exeter University. And in turn, Alice recruited five students, also from Exeter University. And they, in turn, partnered with Alice's guidance with five international students based globally at locations associated with telegraphy in New Zealand, Portugal, India, and Zimbabwe. And today, we're going to hear about these fascinating remote archive projects that they have been inspired by the PK Porthkernos archive and by studies of the impact on global locations. Well, it's a different sort of symposium from what we've run before. So I'll just run through the format for today. There are five group presentations from the students. And after each presentation, there's time for two questions from the audience. Now, we're actually running this as a webinar. So please, can you ask the questions using the Q&A function that you'll find on your Zoom screen? Uh, Alice will monitor the Q&A section on the Zoom. And at the end, as it goes along, and at the end, we'll select two questions for students to answer. The students will answer all other questions by writing in the Q&A facility or at the end of the whole symposium. There'll be an opportunity for further questions and discussion at the end of the symposium, and these should also come via the Q&A function of Zoom. As I say, this is 
all a little new, so we're keeping our fingers crossed. We've got superb technical assistance, so fingers crossed it's all going to work. Uh, can I just say as well, we're very pleased that Anwar, Anwar Akta, that as I said, director of the Somoza, will join us as a guest speaker. And Anwar has actually led workshops with our students throughout the project on issues such as heritage, identity, language, empire, and faith. So I think we're ready to make a start. So I'll hand back to Alice and she will introduce the students and take us forward. Sarah, oh, thank you so much. That was such a great introduction. Um, I'm Alice Howard and I'm the archive research facilitator on this project. That means that I have been enabling the remote access to the PK archive for all of the students. And I have also been hosting Zoom meetings so that the group can all talk together and so that they can talk to their research partners. I have really enjoyed working on this project with all the students and it has been a pleasure to get to know them all and to assist them in their research projects. I'm really excited to share all of their projects with you today and to introduce each of the students. First of all, we have Vida Long, a recent graduate of an MA in Religious Studies at Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand, who has partnered with Eleanor Edge, a recent English graduate of Exeter University. It has been wonderful seeing the work of Vida and Eleanor progress throughout the project. They have researched the impact of telegraphy in New Zealand and with the help of the brilliant web designer Nikki Foley have created a fascinating interactive map which is available on the Port Kano website. It is with a great pleasure that I welcome the first two students, Vida and Eleanor, to talk about their research. Vida and Eleanor, over to you please. Thanks, Alice. I'll just wait for, ah, there she is, cool. Um, hello, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Vida, and um, as Alice said, I'm in New Zealand. And, and this is Eleanor. Yeah, and I'm Eleanor, and I, have as um, Alice said, just graduated from Exeter in Devon. And today we're going to talk to you about our research project, which is an interactive map that looks at the history of the telegraph cable in New Zealand, and particularly the links between colonization and communication. We should begin by talking about Alice and Anwar's influence in the conception and construction of our project. Anwar's seminars throughout these past months have been very influential and informative. At the very beginning of this project, I think it was actually in the first seminar Anwar gave, he talked about the British island story and the ways in which that narrative influences and informs socio-cultural context in Britain, as well as creating paradigms of power. This line of thought was extremely productive as we transitioned our focus from the British island story to the New Zealand island story. And Alice's constant guidance and organization throughout the project was absolutely crucial. Much of our early research utilised the archives at PK in order to gain a full understanding of the impact and reception of the laying of cables in New Zealand. Alice was incredibly helpful in suggesting alternate avenues we could go down and emphasising the potential findings which perhaps on first glance would have looked as substantial and dry. Yeah, um, so our decision to restrict to New Zealand um, was initially because I'm here and it made sense. Um, but also um, once we, once Alice helped us to kind of get into the archive uh, remotely, um, we saw that we weren't going to be low on resources. Um, and it was clear that New Zealand's telegraph history, which actually isn't particularly well documented in secondary sources, we didn't, we weren't able to find much in secondary sources, other than other than one self-published book. Um, but apart from that, in the archives, we had so much primary material to work with, and um, I think that plentitude was why we decided to restrict solely to New Zealand and not extend to Australia, which was our original plan. Originally, we were gonna go Australasia or possibly Oceania, but there was just so much to work with. And um, while 
we actually think that there is a lot of scope for extending to a greater project and we know that there have been other people who've been doing that um, we thought that the breadth of material meant that um, we could stay with a solely New Zealand focus. Yeah, so the outcome of our initial kind of forays into the PK archive, which is also why we decided rather than sticking to one or two themes, which was our initial plan to try and com communicate all of it. Um, in some ways it's complicated matters for us because it is far more convenient and clear to restrict a focus um, here we had to think about coherence and variety, and we certainly had enough variety. Um, but with New Zealand and the Telegraph as the only categorizations of coherence, we were really left wondering how to present all this material that we'd found, uh, which initially felt very sporadic and erratic. And our decision in the end was to communicate this through the medium of an online map, which you see we've done. And I'll, bring, I'll try and bring that up now. And this is our first try at <laughs> bringing it up. So hopefully it goes well. Um, okay. Okay, I'm hoping everybody can see this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, great. Over to you, Elmo. Okay, so when we were looking for ideas as to how to present our findings, we were influenced by Shiloh Kapoor's work on nuclear waste and US military facilities. The medium of the interactive map seems such a great way to allow us to represent a really full relationship between New Zealand and the Telegraph without having to admit any of our strands of research that we were worried would happen with any other method of presentation. It seemed a great way of introducing and educating people to an alternate and omitted history of a community. The map you can see on your screens today is based on the Queer Kerno map, which presents the history of queerness in Cornwall in a really clear and accessible way. And we were very lucky that the lovely Nikki, who was responsible for the Queer Kerno map, also helped design and create our map. The red, white, and black colors you can see on the map were chosen to represent the absolute sovereignty map flag used by Maori throughout New Zealand. And we also decided to use dual place names in both Maori and English for the points on the land to avoid contributing to the erasure of indigenous history through linguistic colonialism. And um, as we said earlier, um, the impetus for choosing this form of communication was because we didn't want to discard research. And at the same time, we were aware that um, with the wrong information communicator, um, the finished project might not be very satisfactory. Um, so, but once we decided on a map, actually, it was kind of odd how all the research we'd been doing, which um, on a sort of bird's eye view looked a bit kind of cluttered and bricolaged, actually just started to develop quite coherent uh, patterns and trends. And we saw it kind of coinciding with a whole lot of other um, historical social contexts that um, we sort of didn't expect. And um, there are all these links which we've discovered, um, but we thought we'd just lead you through a few of those now. So I'm going to attempt to use the map. Hopefully it all works. Um, but just for some context, because I know that uh, I, you know, a lot of people know about New Zealand, but some people maybe don't. Um, New Zealand was colonized by Britain, but it was officially annexed in uh, 1840. And um, there's been European presence here since about 1640, 1642 maybe. Um, and it should be emphasized that um, though uh, we're talking historically, um, and about the Telegraph, which seems slightly tangential um, to a lot of things happen, happening currently in New Zealand. Um, something which repeatedly surfaced throughout our research is actually that our findings weren't particularly obsolete or irrelevant in any way, and um, that they were sort of intricately linked in to um, the effects of colonization that are still being discussed here in New Zealand. And um, the outcomes of colonization, as in, as in all post-colonial countries as well, um, are still present and detrimental. And the project of decolonization is happening here, but um, the hope of that you know, shouldn't undermine 
the past and the contemporary tragedies of colonization. So I think I'll just preface with that. And then I'm just going to discuss four things that came up. There are quite a few points on the map that talk about a lot of different things, but I'm just going to talk about four of them. And one of the first interesting things that we found was that the process of the telegraph and its construction and development in New Zealand mimicked um, urban development in New Zealand, which isn't in itself um, surprising. But what was surprising was the number of places in New Zealand which were once hubs because of the telegraph and now are very small centres agricultural centers, um, holiday places. So I'll just lead you through a few of those. So one of the places where, um, so the first laying site of New Zealand's um, international telegraph cable. So this is the cable from New Zealand to Australia. So this was the first cable linked New Zealand to the rest of the world essentially, um, was in Cable Bay, which is here. So I hope everyone can see that. Um, so Cable Bay um, was origi originally called um, Schroeder's Mistake and its name was changed in 1926. So quite a while after it first became the site of um, a cable station. And originally um, it was a Maori fishing and camping site. This is before con um, European presence. And it was a pa site, which means it was a Māori fortified village. So it was a very important place in Māoridom. And um, sort of a side point is that one of the um, outcomes of doing this research is that, and this is understandable or obvious perhaps, but many of the places where the cable was laid or where there were cable um, huts uh, were places of significance for Māori. Um, that's to be expected because of the outcomes of colonization, but it, it is interesting. Um, so this is Cable Bay. And if this works, might not work. Maybe my internet's, oh yeah, there we go. Um, so this was the interior of Cable Bay and that's the plaque that's there now. Um, and now, I mean, Cable Bay is, I've been there, you know, it's very quiet, very small, but it was once a place of massive development and activity. Um, and that's interesting because um, where the cable started was really around here. This is the hub. So this is in the South Island. And that mimics where um, European presence mainly was. So originally, the South Island was far more developed than the North. Um, so actually the capital, which is now in Wellington here, was going to be in Collingwood over here, which is very near the place of the first cable. Um, and that leads me on to the gold rush <laughs> um, because the gold rush of the 1860s was actually one of the major incentives to have the telegraph in New Zealand and specifically in the South Island, which is where gold was first discovered. And the increased population meant that um, far more Europeans came to New Zealand and they expected the efficiencies and commodities of Europe. And that's also why more railway was established here as well. Um, and the first public telegraph, telegraph was between Christchurch and Littleton. And yeah, there's Littleton. And also Otago, which is where gold was discovered originally. Um, and this is a point for Julius Vogel. And Julius Vogel was probably one of the more important figures in New Zealand history in terms of the telegraph, because um, he really uh, petitioned for it and really thought that it was really important. He was into railway development, telegraph development. Um, he was into increased shipping. Um, so he was a really interesting figure to discover. Um, and then, so that's, that's the South Island, essentially. Um, the gold rush was a very important beat in terms of the telegraph history, which wasn't something we knew when we started off. And then in terms of the North Island, um, something that we came across 
which was fascinating was that um, the development of the telegraph in the, or the laying of the cables rather, in the North Island was both, was really, in, it was bound up in the New Zealand land wars. And the New Zealand land war, wars were in the 1860s. And um, originally they didn't lay cables in the North Island because of the New Zealand land wars, um, because there was just too much disturbance. And then when they did, the cable was used, the telegraph cable was used as a way of communicating to other um, European troops um, about possible Maori invasion. Um, and we also found that in the biography of New Zealand history, uh, there is a small footnote de detailing that Maori were hostile uh, to European development. And we discovered that, that that's not necessarily true. I mean, that's one reading of it. Um, but in fact, hostile to European development was simply because um, Māori were in the middle of, you know, massive land wars with Europeans. And so um, were, were hostile to, you know, a lot of European activity, which isn't necessarily the same as hostile to European development. Um, and the last point we want to talk about was shipping because we've got these ships here as well, which are really interesting. And actually Eleanor has done more on than I have, but um, Iris is probably the most interesting ship, not the most interesting ship, they're all interesting, but um, this one was really important because um, she was, uh, she brought over laying cables and she also brought over arms for the New Zealand wars. She brought over muskets, she brought over supplies. Um, so just the involvement of the ships generally um, I won't go over them all, but it was really fascinating and, and I think, you know, was one of those links that when you're reading about it initially sounds quite um, dry, <laughs> but the ships were so important to, I mean, just generally important to the development of New Zealand and, and understanding its colonial context, but in terms of the telegraph, it was also important. Um, so that's all from me. Yeah, thank you, Vida. So one of the initial aims that I think both Vida and I were really drawn to um, of the PK Collect Connected Collections project was to explore the alternate histories of communities impacted and formed around the arrival of the telegraph system. And uh, we really hope that our project has gone some way to furthering this idea. There is a lot more on the map that we don't have time to go over today, uh, but we hope you'll be able to explore the map on the website. And we are also sure that almost every one of the points on the map would be prime for further and greater research. Yeah, and I also, we also just thought we'd add something about um, our choice of media in terms of kind of concluding statements, um, because we're, we're really pleased with the map. We think it's really great. But one thing we were reflecting on was that um, uh, in some ways, choosing the map as a communication tool is um, somewhat of a conflict uh, because mapping conventions reflect legacies of imperial exploration, resource extraction, colonization and state control. And the map has always been fundamentally an instrument of power because it's not really uh, real, it's an abstraction from reality, which was designed and motivated by practical military and political concerns and concerns of empire. And it's a way of representing space which facilitates domination. And in New Zealand, I mean, that domination started with Abel Tasman, who first started um, doing cartography around New Zealand and it continued with James Cook and the effects of cartography are still ongoing and it's not lost in us that we are trying to in doing this map we were trying to communicate a lost strand of colonial history through a tool if a passive one of colonial domination um, but I think those conflicts are not ones we're seeking to resolve by flagging them up but we um, they are one of the ongoing kind of thought processes of, this, processes of this work. And it's been really interesting to think about those throughout these last few months. Thank you.
Great, Vida and Helena, thank you so much um, yeah, for such a thoughtful and insightful presentation. Um, I have learned so much about the impact of telegraphy in New Zealand from your work, and it's definitely been an invaluable contribution to the PK archive and website. Um, I just wanted to ask you one question, if that's okay. I was talking to my friend about this the other day, and I just, and I know we've talked about it a lot before as well, and how interesting sort of this, the link between like sacred spaces um, in New Zealand and sort of the, and telegraphy. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind saying a few words about, more about that, please. Um, well, sacred spaces in New Zealand itself is too large a topic to condense, but where it inter interlinks with the telegraph is in terms of high land, um, because cable stations were often in New Zealand anyway, put um, on up on high land because we have a lot of risk of tsunami. And um, so are sacred spaces <laughs> in, in Māoridom, um, often um, uh, a point of high land is seen as a connection to the heavens. So it's sacred, it's valuable. Often there are things called po whenua, which are, I don't, if you know what totem poles are, they're a bit like that, um, but designed in, in Māori carving. Um, so it just turns out that a lot of the places where cable stations um, were, so that they weren't, you know, taken out by tsunami or flooding, were also sacred spaces. Um, and I think that probably contributes, I'm sure that contributed to issues in the Māori land court um, more recently over the last sort of century, um, maybe perhaps not articulated, but there was more land grabs um, in places which were sacred to Māori, and I'm, I'm sure that's not coincidental. Hope that sort of yeah. answers it. No, that's great. Thank you so much. And actually, we've got a question come in through the Q&A from um, Charlotte Todd. Um, and she's asked, how do you how do you think this research could be taken forward? I could go first and then Elmore, I don't know if you want to add anything or, um, well, I think a lot of points could be taken forward, probably maybe by somebody else who, who was more specialized in the area, I don't know. I mean, I think more could be added to the map. I think more research could be done on every one of the points we've got on the map. I think generally there could be more research on the links between, um, I don't know how to phrase this without sounding clumsy, but um, like quiet forms of colonization, um, which is a area I'm not quite sure how much there's being done in New Zealand at the moment. I don't think very much. Um, and by quiet, I mean sort of almost unobtrusive or <laughs> stealth maybe. Um, but beyond that, I mean, I think that there are lots of links with Australia as well. I mean, Australia and New Zealand's connection is very, very strong, even if it's somewhat embattled at times. Um, and I think that the comparison between how Māori reacted to the telegraph here in contrast to how the Aborigin Aboriginals of Australia reacted to it would be really interesting um, because in Australia the Aborigines were categorized as a silent people um, so their colonization is a completely different ball game um, and I think probably a comparative study would be really fascinating. Yeah, just to add uh, to what Vida said, um, I mean, our map was only really ever intended to kind of be an introduction um, to kind of a really historically understudied area and kind of history. And uh, even when we were in the uh, archives and we decided to kind of narrow down our focus from Australia and New Zealand to just New Zealand, there was such a wealth of resources that we had to kind of refine and narrow down. So there is definitely 
way there's much more that could be written and done but I think for us our aim was always just to kind of introduce and educate like the public to this topic. Great thank you so much that's yeah such a great answer and we've just had two more questions come in which I'm going to ask both of you now as I know that for Vida it's getting very late if we wait until the end of the symposium. So we have a question here from David and he says, um, thanks for your talk, just to bring it up a level, I'm fascinated by the synergy between the British Empire, colonialization and the global telegraph cable network. What do you think are the main themes that can be drawn out? It's clear, clearly about the ability for Britain to communicate rapidly with colonies, dominions, but also of control, um, interested in your thoughts. So if you have Vida and Ellen, if you'd like to answer that, please. Yeah. Um, it's difficult to be put on the spot to answer that one, but I'll try. <laughs> um, what are the main things that can be drawn out? I think when we, when I was thinking about it as a whole, um, yes, rapid communication was very important. Yes, uh, communication with um, uh, the colonies and other dominions. Um, but I think also internal communication is interesting, like not necessarily, I think uh, the development of the telegraph where it got to the point where New Zealand was able to communicate with Australia and and the rest of the world was was very important and um, an, an important historical beat in terms of colonization and empire, but actually looking at how internally colonization was happening um, because New Zealand is so isolated as well. I think this is the thing about an isolated country. Um, the colonization is is always the important thing is is the country it's happening in and what fascinated me was the way um the telegraph was used um to to privilege european thought and european development inside new zealand um so that would be my rather inarticulate answer i'm sorry i can't be more coherent Hey, Vida, thank you so much. And um, we have um, one last question, um, if you wouldn't mind. So it's from Alison. And they've asked, was there information you discovered in the archive you would have liked to include but couldn't for reasons of time or anything else? Well, I can answer that very easily. Um, there were loads of um, like documents I think I can't remember the 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 official name, um, but they were like documents that um, oh maybe you know Alice, like signed by the king. <laughs> they were fascinating, like allowing allowing the movement of the cables um, from one place to another, um, and it was really interesting how you would have thought that it could just happen internally you know I don't know they would, could have gone the governor general to do it or something but it did they got got sent all the way to Britain um so that was really interesting um you know there's a there's an island just off Auckland called Great Barrier and for a telegraph cable to be set up you know so much documentation um which is good but it was it was it's you know I would have liked to be able to include more about that and we just didn't Great, thanks so much, Vida. Eleanor, did you want to add anything else? Um, I think the name Vida's uh, searching for, I know it's very late, but I think it's the royal decrees we were looking at that were really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, she answered that beautifully, definitely. There was, there's so much, um, we were so lucky with the archives at PK and uh, there was definitely much more that we kind of, we wanted to include, but just couldn't just because of 
oh, worry of overload of information. So yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's so interesting to hear you talk about the map. And I've yeah put a link to it in the chat to everyone and also into the Q&A as well. Um, so yeah, thank you so much and thank you for answering the question so well. That was brilliant. Exciting. Um, okay, so next um, we have presentations from Prabhupad Rafa and Jay Hollis. And Prabhupad is a student at ITT Bombay doing a bachelor's in technology in Mumbai. And Jay is studying politics and international relations at Exeter University. They have explored ecology, questioning how telegraphy interacted with and impacted the wider environment, particularly focusing on gutta percha and chorido worms. This has been particularly relevant and timely work for PK Porcano, as it not only links to our collection, but also to the work of Planet PK, the museum's envi environmental initiative. So first of all, um, Prabhupad will introduce his pre-recorded talk, which I will then play, followed um, by Jay's video, which he'll also introduce. So Prabhupad has written three blogs available on the Port Kano website. These explore gutta percha, and additionally, he has written a blog that explores the impact of landline telegraphy in India before 1870 an area that is often not covered at the museum, but is very important as it tells the history of the build-up to the first cable coming ashore in Port Kano in 1870. So Papad, if you would like to introduce yourself um, before I play your talk, please. Oh, thank you, Atlas. Um, uh, namaste, I am Prabhat from Mumbai in India. I am studying engineering at IIT Bombay. My research topic for the project is on ecological impacts of telegraphy. It includes gutta percha and tropical plantations, while also looking at the imbalances and unsustainability. On the second part, important areas covered are method of extraction, natives, labor, and regulating laws. In conclusion, I have put a case study that is prepared on strategic implementation of telegraph with special emphasis on British Empire in India and Indian Rebellion of 1857. This is quite brief and I have put a talk. Now I request Alice to put forward the talk. Perfect, great. I will share the talk now. Namaste. I am Prabhat from Mumbai. I am studying BTEC Engineering at IIT Bombay. Our group has explored the ecological impact of telegraphy while also looking from the perspective of strategic implementation, especially British Empire in India. The first part is about Gata Pacha, ecological impacts and unsustainability. Gata Pacha, name is derived from a Malay word Gata, translated as latex. Pacha is local name for Pelequum Gata and refers to a natural latex produced from a certain Southeast Asian tree. In 1850, first international cable was laid between England and France by English Channel Submarine Telegraph Company. In particular, Gata Pacha was needed as insulation for underwater telegraph cables, which led to unsustainable destruction and collapse of supply. The conception of the telegraph network around the world with imperial capitals as important node points was evidently a huge industrial undertaking. This complex feature involved engineering, manufacturing, and installation of thousands of miles of cable, much of which was laid across the ocean. It is criticized that the imperial authorities and the telegraph company were least concerned about the future of this precious tropical rainforest resource, and it was replaced by exploiting. It is high time now to put analysis of environmental impacts at center for every development planning process. Planet PK is an environmental program at PK Port Puerno with a vision to ensure wildlife and habitat protection in a more sustainable way. It emphasizes 
on our duty as an individual, community, society, and responsible being to conserve natural heritage, protect wildlife, and provide for sustainable environment. This is most relevant in modern scenario, whereby sustainable development goals (SDGs 2030) are starting to come up in all domains as an immediate policy framework for most countries, multilateral forums, and private enterprises. The second article is based on tropical plantations, extraction, natives, and regulating laws. The question of what is the best method for collecting gutta percha has troubled owners and dealers from the beginning. The method of extraction of gutta percha was primitive, localized in technique, and had not changed before its use spread beyond Southeast Asia. It is well established that timber cutting is all perilous work. and there are increased chances of numerous deaths and injuries the two vital defects of the method are one the method is very wasteful the yield from each tree being a small portion to the total amount the other that it leaves the future unaccountable and unsustainable it is important to review the few steps taken toward regulating way in which gutta percha was collected and marketed The first law passed was in 1899 to prohibit the felling of trees. But as the law never penetrated to the wild tribes of the interior where the collecting was actually done, it was not effective. A more likely surer method of stopping the exploitation. Second law was passed, which prohibited the exportation of gutta percha from coast towns in Malay states in which the English could exercise personal supervision. The effort involved. In finding the trees in the forest and then collecting, carrying, trading, and shipping the product indicates not only a profitable trade but one that engaged much of the population. The trade depended upon the skills and knowledge of each of these indigenous groups. Sir James Brooke, strategy for the development was European capital and Chinese labor. Some Chinese workers, both sponsored and unsponsored, came directly from China. and were indentured on arrival in Sarawak from 1905 other companies also began employing indentured workers from java on its plantation estates indentured labor was legally bound to the company's service and was liable to imprisonment for absconding a benefit for the employer but considered a mild type of slave labor a key study is put forward titled strategic implementation of telegraph the uprisings of 1857 were a major turning point in the history of british rule in india and an equally major test for the telegraph system recently built in india the then governor general of india lord dalhousie paved the way for imperial telegraph department in 1850 in 1854 the british in india completed an 800 mile telegraph line between kolkata and agra and this was further connected to bombay and madras a brief account of the incident of the telegraph office was first published in 1902 titled delhi past and present sir robert mont mary a british administrator in colonial india had remarked after the mutiny of 1857 the electric telegraph has saved india The telegraph memorial made of grey granite was erected on April 19, 1902 to commemorate the loyal and devoted service of Delhi Telegraph Office staff on the eventful 11th May 1857. So outlines the inscription on the obelisk. A decisive turn of events followed the dispatch from Telegraph Office in Delhi, which warned other British stations about the revolt. the impact of the telegraph message sent from delhi has been highlighted in most british accounts of the period expansion of swift telegraph communication system to india was of strategic importance for the government after the indian mutiny of 1857 similarly after subsequent development in telegraph industry malta was connected to alexandria in 1868 france to newfoundland in 1869 india hong kong China and Japan by 1870, Australia to the outside world in 
in South America by 1874. The British government believed that the telegraph would provide the means for much greater central control of overseas possessions. Thank you and have a good day. Great, Papa, thank you for such a great talk. And um, we'll do some questions about that at the, after Jay's talk. So Jay, if you would like to um, introduce the video you have made and then I will play it. Um, thank you, Alice. Um, and thank you everyone for coming today. I hope that you um, uh, find it interesting and stimulating. Um, so what I've done is I've done a narrated presentation um, that uh, shows the trajectory of my research and hopefully uh, my, my thinking. It's not uh, comprehensive, um, but hopefully that this will stimulate questions because that's what it's all about. Um, I just want to touch on one thing before I play it that uh, Gareth um, said at the beginning. Um, he's, he spoke about uh, the, the purpose of this project was um, to um, uh, to approach things differently, different approaches, different questions, um, things that people might not have considered before. And um, I think, I suppose, and challenging dominant narratives, because that's what decolonization is all about, challenging uh, the dominant narratives and the dominant histories. Well, in my research, the dominant narrative is a human narrative. Um, so inspired by some trends in academia, um, human animal studies, uh, multi-species ethnography, ways of looking at the world uh, that takes into account all of the uh, uh, ecological community, all of the animals, the plant life that's involved. Um, so, and we often, you know, uh, forget that the uh, telegraphy um, was laid uh, under the sea and um, there was, um, which is a, a very rich and diverse um, world. Um, so um, yeah, I will play my video. Um, I'll just get into that. Um, so do I share my screen or do you, do you want, want to do it? Do you want me to play it, Jay, or would you? Yeah, you do it. Yeah, you, you do. But if it doesn't work, I'll, I'll try and share my screen, Alice. Great, I've got it up ready, so. Okay, lovely. Yeah, alongside the video, Jay has also produced a blog called Strands, which he'll talk to you about in the video. And it's around the untold stories around telegraphy and, as he said, the things we wouldn't usually associate with communication. And it's with a particular focus on the Torito worm or ship worm. And as part of Digital Takeover Day earlier in the year, um, Jay wrote a fascinating blog about seashells and telegraphy, which was commented on, I believe, by a previous cable and wireless worker, which inspired Jay's current research. So now I will play Jay's video. My work in Porthkirno Museum's archives began with the idea of untold stories, something that is not included in the narrative of telegraphy, but should be. I started by looking through volumes of the Zodiac magazine and discovered its pages documented a rich and patchy company culture, filled with comedy, sport, illustration and book reviews. I began to understand that the history of the undersea telegraph cable, like all technological artefacts, is a patchwork of lives and relationships. This inspired me to produce a blog called Strands, the purpose of which was to write about those unruly and seemingly unconnected pages of the Zodiac and show that while cable kings like John Pender were important aspects of telegraphy's history, so were obituaries, sea monsters, shells, magic, things that one might not usually consider when they think about the telegraph, but things that nonetheless make up its history. For example, the tragic death of a telegraph worker to pneumonia was memorialised using telegraphic metaphors such as the ends are grappled and spliced in heaven. And in Victorian Britain, the telegraph coincided with an explosion of mediums and psychics who professed that if communication across oceans was now possible, 
so too was communication between heaven and earth. The blog was a success, but as I became more aware of my colleagues' research projects, I became inspired by their ability to anchor their research to a theme or niche, whether that be language, sacred spaces, anti-colonial resistance or life at telegraph stations. Prabhad and I spoke regularly and decided that it was important to ask where the telegraph fitted into the wider environment, teasing out stories of plant and animal life. This was going to be our niche. Alongside Prabhad, I became interested in the natural rubber gutta percha and its unsustainable usage as an insulator for the cable. However, I found that the destruction of forests wasn't the only reason this plant was unsustainable. The other reason was that when it was laid under the sea, it was eaten by marine life, negating its insulating properties. The biggest culprit? The naval shipworm, which is not actually a worm, but a kind of shellfish. I returned to the Zodiac magazine and found a cartoon depicting a tug of war between a ship and a giant fish. While it didn't mention any worms, it describes how a mighty fish had eaten their gutta percha and risked sinking them unless they cut it open and reclaimed it. Was this a metaphor for the shipworm? I began searching in newspapers and journals for any reference to this shipworm and quickly discovered how significant an animal this was. For example, the Journal for the Society of Telegraph Engineers dedicated a whole issue on the shipworm. On one page, a correspondence is documented between the post officer's first engineer-in-chief and William B. Carpenter, an eminent invertebrate zoologist. They discuss what kind of creature could have bored into a cable that was laid in the Irish Sea. Carpenter deemed this a matter of such importance that he didn't rely on his judgment alone, but consulted with other experts in the field. Together, they concluded it must have been a crustacean or lice called Limnoria. He described it as a most destructive creature whose ravages have long been a source of great injury. Even the chemist, John Hall Gladstone, said of the naval shipworm, he may destroy in a minute what will take thousands of pounds and a whole year to repair. The commercial world began consulting with natural historians and scientists, and everyone from the telegraph pioneer Robert Newell to Thomas Huxley debated the impact that various marine fauna had on the life of the telegraph. Throughout the journal, there are references to experiments conducted in order to discern what materials were more prone to attack. And it became clear that a great deal of money and energy was put into understanding these animals' motives. While the shipworm was certainly not the only animal to disrupt the project of telegraphy, it is by far the most documented, especially in maritime history. It was first recorded in the 1730s during the shipworm epidemic that plagued the Netherlands. When a minor storm hit Zealand in the autumn of 1730, coastal inspectors were alarmed to find that the wooden buttresses and wave breakers that guarded human populations against floods were bored into and destroyed. The culprit was the shipworm. Authorities clad structures in tar and copper nails. Scientists probed the worm's anatomy and reproductive cycles, and religious leaders heralded a time of divine retribution and punishment for Dutch society's sins. The worm had such an impact on Dutch life at the time that some feared the survival of the Kingdom of Holland altogether. A century later, the shipworm was described as a hidden destroyer and an enemy of mankind. And in many ways, my research suggests that this animal has been at the forefront of human anxiety and failure at sea for as long as we have been at sea. 
One of the artefacts in the museum is a wooden board with 14 mounted cable samples on it. Each one shows an example of cable failure or fault, showing damage from shipworms, but also fish and crab nests. The purpose of this is to show why and how cables were armoured. Here, the shipworm's impact is less about mindless destruction and more about the role of non-human organisms in the trajectory of cable engineering. The naval shipworm, along with other marine fauna, shaped debate and development in the history of telegraphy. For historians, the Dutch shipworm epidemic was not a decade of failure, but one of ingenuity and technical experimentation. I'm not surprised that the museum has largely neglected this animal. As one commentator said in the Journal for the Society of Telegraph Engineers, when we examine its fragile shell, semi-transparent tissues and soft body almost incapable of motion, we can hardly conceive that the shipworm is a creature to be feared. And yet, the impact this animal has had on telegraphy deserves as much attention as the pioneers and industrialists. Wow, thank you so much. Both of those, the video and the talk were so great and um, yeah, really engaging. And yeah, thanks for such a personal and insightful way you both approached this project. Um, so yeah, I wanted to ask, um, Anwar, do you have a question, any questions for um, Jay or Prabhupad, please? Yeah. Uh so a question to you both. What was the um, the most enjoyable part of the research and what was the most difficult? Okay, so first I will start with the most enjoyable part. Mm -hmm. Is uh, First of all, we both were working on a completely different part. Okay. But then we somehow found commons into it and just the way as Jay highlighted that when any important factor is taken into account, like the cables, we generally discard the smaller things just like the how sheep worms were never put into the uh, recordings of it so same way like indian rebellion is a major uh, administrative thing in for the control of the overseas position right mm -hmm. so in the in in that way the smaller parts to uh, suppress the rebellion and to take control and to uh, negate the rebellion part of it there were lot of impact of the communication and information system which telegraph at that time played but it was not given much credit for that part yeah i think that's um really succinctly put um uh, prabat and <clears throat> um actually yeah to begin with we were on totally sort of different um uh sort of uh, places in our research and we wanted to do sort of different things um, and that did concern me at first, but I think that actually became our strength because I think that we um, chose a, a, a very broad theme and took it down a route that was uh, true to ourselves. And um, yeah, it's just been great working with Prabat. So yeah. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. They were great answers. And um, yeah, Gareth, do you have a uh, question you'd like to ask um, Prabhupada and Jay, please? Yes, I think I'm, I'm aware of one occasion or one when the cable manufacturers actually took ownership of some of the plantations for gutta percha. Um, and one was led by uh, Lord Selborne. And the idea I think there was, was that they could control the supply of gutta percha and prevent other competing cable companies from having access to it. Do, do you know whether that was common? I, I personally, I am um, not sure about that. I think Prabhat looked more at that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, so uh, in this regard, I, I do have something to put forward. Uh, like in the Sarawak Island, there was an administration, Sir James Brooks. So, 
he wanted to control the uh, uh, the market of the uh, plantations and the how it should be regulated because there were a lot of factors at the same time as in the natives were also indulged in this and they were trading on their own and it was quite unregulated then there were uh, the labor that was imported and uh, and also the uh, private companies and the telegraph companies working for the uh, uh, plantations and actual uh, production of the gutta pacha so uh, in that in this regard they put forward uh, two of the laws that i actually did discuss and uh, that was much part two uh, that was like they were trying to regulate it in somehow uh, although it was not very effective and did not go quite well okay that's good thank you can i just add one other thing about a few years ago now um charlotte will remember better than i do um samples big slabs of gutta percha came ashore on the beaches in cornwall and in northern france and Brittany. and uh, this was i think would probably of egg that had been undiscovered and then got disturbed and suddenly all these slabs came up on the beaches and um, I'm pretty sure that we've got at least one example in the uh, in, in the collection. Yeah, so the slabs actually read Teji Peter that was based on uh, that was a company's name uh, in uh, and that slabs do come out because some years ago while they were transporting the Gata Pacha, the ship sank in the ocean and so that's why they are coming up and uh, some of the discoveries are being put forward and i guess the first discovered slab was on the pk port Cunio beach only so uh, from that it came yeah up. good thank you great thanks so much and um, we've had a comment through on the q a um from stuart and they have, uh, they have said in 1915, the Construction and Maintenance Co, the world's leading supplier of submarine telegraph cables set up its own plantation called Salborne Estate in Malaya. This continued until it was overrun by the Japanese in 1942, after the war got a purchase was superseded by polythene. Um, so it's not a direct question now, but we'd, um, Either of you like to comment on that, please? Because um, from the point of view of my um, research, um, there were, ever since the cables were laid, they, there were experiments on which materials, plant-based materials, were the, which insulators were the right things to use. And they had hemp, uh, they had good percha and Indian rubber and all these different um, variations and combinations and, um, so I think it's it's an interesting, it's a very interesting history um, with lots of different uh, reasons as to why it um, good to purchase ended up uh, not being sustainable and was replaced by other materials. Um, yes, and because the gutta pacha were like invented in the part when uh, the telegraph country was just coming up, and this is about in the late. 19th century and uh, as the year mentioned for the pair polyethylene is in 1915 so uh, almost around 75 years have been passed and uh, in in that time technology was not that developed so uh, th there were like many experimentation work uh, as to what was the best material for it okay thanks so much and um charlotte todd has messaged to the hosts and panelists, I hope doesn't mind that I'm going to read it out. She said, great to see a different approach to the history of telegraphy and exploring areas that have been often overlooked, especially with regards to ecology and ecological impact. And she said, well done to Pad Pad and Jay. And she also said that we do have the slab of gutta percha in the archive and it has been marked with the plantation name. And I'm sorry, I can't pronounce this, but it's Tipsha. And it was donated to the collection by the lady who found it on a beach in Cornwall. So, yeah, thank you so much, Jay and Prabhupada, for yeah, such great research and um, also for the engaging talks. And um, so next it is my pleasure to introduce Nadia and Jasmine. 
And Nadia Rodriguez is doing a PhD in heritage of Portuguese influences at the University of Coimbra in Portugal. And Jasmine Lowe is a recent graduate of archeology span at Exeter University and is about to start an MA in museum studies at Manchester University. Jasmine and Nadia's project explored the life of telegraph workers at the Singapore station. They have created a captivating website using a large range of archive material from Port Cano and elsewhere. They have demonstrated exemplary research skills in pulling together different research material. And they have also produced a film which they researched, wrote the script for, narrated, and requested all the material from Port Cano archive. Video is filmed and edited by Alban Ronard with music by Annabelle Hockey Smith. So, although Nadia and Jasmine were unable to come to Port Cano, as this was a remote project, um, but they requested all the um, they requested that the film be shot in our archive. So, first of all, I will show the film, and then Jasmine, who sends her apologies, she is currently on a flight from Hong Kong to the UK to start her MA, is unable to be here today, but then I will play her talk. And then Nadia will give a talk and answer any questions. So it is very exciting to share the film with you, um, which is an absorbing peek into the PK archive. And I also very much um, enjoyed working on this film. So I will now share my screen with you. There is more in PK Museum besides the objects on display. In this archive, there is still a lot to explore. Not only documents of telegraph stations of England are stored here, but also documents of stations across the globe, such as Singapore's. Singapore was part of the Malay Empire and later became a British colony. Bowers and Illiard's albums show how Singapore looked like in the 1920s and 1930s. The albums present people attending social events and landscapes of other Asian destinations, such as the Java Island. Singapore has long been a mixed community. Located at the tip of the Malay Peninsula, Malay was the dominant ethnic group until the 19th century. In 1867, Singapore was directly controlled by Britain as part of these Straits settlements. The British brought Indian and Chinese labor to Singapore, and they later settled here. That's why people of different ethnic backgrounds worked at the telegraph station. The cartoon of the Zodiac, a staff magazine of the British telecommunications company Cable and Wireless, showed that the ethnic background of staff of the Singapore station was the first. You may notice that the native population joined here were all associated with lower positions. We do not know does the cartoon depicted the situation accurately, but we should bear in mind that the Zodiac was written by the Western population, which could only represent their point of views. Another piece of a cartoon drawn in 1912 reflects the discrimination towards the local population. As Singapore slowly went through westernization, a Chinese man who wore a Qing Dynasty hairstyle, known as the Kill, gradually changed his style to western fashion. From how the cartoon list titled the cartoon, we know that in Singapore station, the natives were generally looked down by the western staff. A rules and regulations booklet of the Singapore station is found from the archive. It documented the duties and responsibilities of the staff. Staff were divided into four classes, received a different amount of salary and assurance. In general, a staff quarters would be provided for staffs, otherwise staffs would be given a house allowance. Working at the station seems to be a well-paid job. 
but one should be careful of mis the mistakes they may make, otherwise they would be penalized. For every error in messages, one day's pay of the staff would be penalized. As you may not notice, working at the station was not a piece of cake. Telegraph workers had to be highly concentrated on their work and typed it quickly, so as to deliver a message accurately. Hence, sometimes mistakes may be made. Luckily, the rules book stated that such fines would not exceed in any one month one-eighth of the officer's pay, protected the workers from harsh penalties. Some of the most interesting items in the archive are diaries and documents written in first person. One of them is the review report which gave us a description of the Singapore invasion by the Japanese troops and his life as a prisoner. Another valorous testimonial is given by Rowan's diary that was also in Singapore during this fatidic day. Their memoirs offer as relevant details such as the record destruction prior to the invasion, the evacuation process, the captivity and even the meals taken. The archive also keeps the interviews of the children of the telegraph company workers who were overseas when the war started which is a great complement to these memoirs. The existing documents in the archive allow us to have a glimpse of how the Singapore station was organized, who were these workers, which language did they use, which rules they must obey, what happened to them in moments of crisis, how were they perceived? These are the questions we want to answer. Singapore was, and still is, a central place in Eastern Asia and the telegraph station also contributed to make it the outstanding cultural melting pot that it is today. Great, wow, thank you for such a great film. That was great to see that. And um, so now I'm going to play Jasmine's talk and then Nadia will um, answer any questions. So I'm just going to share my screen again. Hello everyone, I'm Jasmine, a recent graduate of the University of Exeter. By the time you're watching this video, I'm on the flight from Hong Kong to London. Um, I really wished to join this symposium, but that's how things might work out. Oh, sorry about that, and let's get moved on. The video Alice just played briefly introduced some of the highlights of our project. So basically, our project is to study the Singapore Telegraph Station using materials found in the PK archive. In the beginning, Nadia and I wanted to study the impact of colonialism on native languages in former colonies. However, there was an insufficient amount of evidence for our study, so we changed our target to Singapore, a place that is less disgusted in terms of its telegraph history. Surprisingly, there are quite a lot of information found in the PK archive, including um, articles published on in the staff magazines and a wartime diary. These fascinating materials motivate us to do a case study on Singapore Telegraph Station um, to investigate how Singapore contributes to the international communication network and the social life of the station workers. Um, we have written up some articles and posted them on our webpage. We hope our webpage could shed lights on further research of the Singapore Telegraph history. There are four themes, how Singapore's location has contributed to the construction of the International Communication Network, who worked in the station, telegraph worker Cecil Howard referee's wartime journey in Singapore and Malay, as well as some personal albums snapshotted Singapore. My research is um, mainly about the first two themes, while Nadia is interested in studying the social lives of workers and the wartime diary. Out of the five articles I've written, there are two I particularly wanted to share with you today. The first one is about the importance of Singapore and the cable network. 
As you may not know, Singapore acts as a middleman to connect the Far East with the Western world. Situated at the tip of the Malay Peninsula and right next to the Strait of Malacca, Singapore's location made it convenient to connect the islands and Australia. For Singapore, the first telegraph cable between England and Australia was built in 1870. In 1870, they extended UK Madras cable to Singapore and from there to islands of Java and to Darwin of Australia. In the same year, the well-known Sylvan Cable was built, extended the UK-Bombay Cable to Singapore and Hong Kong. Later, the cable extended from Hong Kong to Macau, linking this Portuguese colony to the network as well. These new cables had enabled effective communications across the globe and had fastened the speed of sending signals. Singapore's supreme location and its contribution to the international telegraph network had paved its way to become the modern international financial center. Telegraph has taken a place in, ship, in shaping the city into an international exchange center and enhanced its competitiveness in the world. In fact, there is a key reason why we choose to study Singapore Telegraph Station. As Singapore is a diverse community that Malaysians, Chinese, Indian, as well as some Western population settled here, we wonder if there are any show local people worked in the telegraph station as well. Since 1826, Singapore became part of the British India. It had led to mass migration and the formation of a large settled Indian population in Singapore. Chinese immigrants also came to work for the pepper and gambia plantation. In the 19th to 20th century, not everyone could be afforded the cost of attending a telegraph training school, nor specialized in engineering, etc. So we are curious, would the locals be able to work in the station? As discussed in the video, the cartoon showed that Indian, Chinese, Malaysian, Muslims, etc. were all associated with low-level jobs. It may be the case that few natives worked in the high rank owing to educational and language barriers. Under the British colonial government control, English gained the prestige as the language of administration, law and business in Singapore. However, few people outside of an educated elite spoke English. As telegraph codes are created based on English, uh, the company may require staff to have high English proficiency levels. So in the early colonial era, natives did not have much chance to receive higher education nor attending a school, so native staff could barely obtain a high level positions in the early period. The problem of few local workers at the administrative le level may be attributed to the fact that there is discrimination against the local population. During the colonial era, Western countries seldom regarded Asian countries as the third world and that were undeveloped, uneducated and uncivilized owing to the technological backwardness. First, it is not uncommon to see such racist cartoons being published in the early 20th century. Workplace discrimination was very likely occurred in the Singapore station and any other colonial stations. The telegraph station was a miniature of the 20th century Singapore. Administrated by the British government and without sound education, the locals had no way to climb up the social ladder. Other than the two articles I just shared, there are other articles about rules and regulations, the evolution of the station building, and the journey of the cable ship Sherrod Austin. Um, I have had a lot of fun looking at the history of the station, 
as it eventually changed the surrounding landscape. There are some intriguing rules and regulations for the telegraph workers as well. So do check out our articles if you want something to brighten up your day. <laughs> Nadia's research on the wartime diary is really intriguing as well. So let's pass the mic to Nadia. Everyone. So um, Jasmine already introduced um, the, the project and also the video helps us to understand what, what we are um, aiming to show. I don't know if you can see my screen. Yes, good. So basically, as Jasmine mentioned, um, I was more focused in, the, um, in some diaries and memories and reports. And um, I found this one really interesting because it shows about the day that J Japan invaded Singapore. And um, we can have more information about who were the people that worked there. I mean, um, the high administra administrators, um, including engineers, and we can have a glimpse of their uh, careers. Most of them start in Port Cornell. And normally they also end in Port Cornwall as well. Um, and uh, we, I'm going to focus in two of them, an engineer and an administrator. They are Robbins and Riviere. And um, if we, I was, I have to admit that I was a little bit surprised what with what I found. Um, because beside the the fact of the description of, of the captivity, there was considerations about the local people and um, I would say an westernized way of looking to, to those locals. So for instance, when Robbins mentions that he is going to leave the, his house, um, he describes his cook as what we would consider nowadays to be the, the good sauvage or uh, bon sauvage in, in French that um, he shows through emotions that is not considered uh, appropriate. Uh, he also shows loyalty because he's worried and he's concerned about Robin's lunch and ownership uh, because he does not accept to take anything from the house. There's also a lot of things related with civilization, cleanliness and European food, for instance, there's a part when he mentions that he was looking for a little comfort and civilization. European food and cleanliness, which means that probably um, he wouldn't consider the things, the, the places where he was to be that way. Um, when referring to a Chinese restaurant, he says, it was the dirtiest and most unpleasant cafe that I had experienced so far. Yet, I was really... I was ready for a meal of some sort and must confess that I enjoyed it. So there's this mix um, opinions about his experiences. And then he confronts it with what he considers to be civilized. That is um, a bottle of port, some biscuits, light supper, soup and sandwiches. And this again was not kind of things that I was expecting to find in um, war memory. He also mentions the evacuation procedures and he also um, draws some maps of the, the itinerary that they took. And um, he mentions all, he describes all the moments of the different uh, attacks of the Japanese. And he also <laughs> mentions how they decided who were the ones who should stay and the ones who should leave. He say that uh, they draw lots in the head and the last two papers were the ones that should stay. Also, he mentions captivity and once again, he's really concerned about food. So in the first day, he, I mean, in the first month, he even has a kind of a menu of what he has for breakfast, lunch and supper. He also mentions that they used to spend their time um, playing cards, ping pong sometimes. They, there's also other sad moments about people getting ill and dying. And um, the mass, the Easter, Christmas, all these 
details are also in here. And the other part that I was expecting to see more photographs of local people, I had to admit, but basically it's um, in accordance to what we find in the memoirs. Um, these high administrators were uh, kind of, um, um, they were not so open to the local world. So the image that we have is the city of Singapore, of course, and uh, all the places that they used to pass by. And the places where they used to, to have fun, clubs, dinners, weddings, all kinds of social life. And the travel destinations, different islands, some of them belonging to the Dutch at the time. But it shows that uh, there's not much information in the photographs, for instance, about, um, about the local people. And this I also found interesting because this is um, a program of one of the events. And you also have, you even have the, um, the people, the, the songs that were singing and the, the sketch that were taken and all these, these details. I think that it will be interesting to, to explore more. So I'm going to leave you to ask any questions, something that you didn't really understood or please let me know. Nadia, thanks so much. Um, so interesting to hear about all of your research um, you have carried out and especially as Jasmine mentioned in the video that, um, that, um, that the life at Singapore station was you know, not so covered in the Port Kano archive and you've done such a great job of drawing it all together. Um, yeah, so we have one question that's come through from Charlotte in the chat and she has asked what was your favorite item from the Port Kano archive? My favorite item, I have to admit that uh, I like the, the cartoons in the, in the Zodiac. I really like the Zodiac part. Of course, photos are really nice. And I mean, there, I cannot say that I have a, diary, a, a favorite one, <laughs> but I was really surprised about, about the Zodiac. Not only about the, the the topic that we were studying, but all the things about the zodiac were really interesting, and I had no idea that it even existed. Great, perfect. Thank you so much. And um, Gareth, would you like to ask Nadia a question, please? <clears throat> do, do you have any uh, ideas to how large, how many people have actually employed in the cable station in Singapore and, and it went at its peak period? Um, sorry, yeah. I don't have that. How, how, many, how many people were employed in Singapore to work on the telegraph? Because in some of the photos, it looked like quite a large number of people. Yes, I don't have that information. And um, sorry. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Yes, it, we we um, we were looking quite a lot at the seeing if we could find record the staff records for people stationed at Singapore. But in the Port Kano archive, the way that the staff records are categorised is that it's not by station, so it's very difficult to get an exact idea of how many staff were at each station. Right. Um, so we have another question that's just come in and Nadia, if you'd like to answer this one. So it says, when did PK start to train local staff? Um, I'm not sure if that's specific to Singapore. I don't know if, if you came across any information on that. Yes, probably Jasmine will answer you that, but um, I'm not sure about, sorry. Perfect, no, that's fine, thank you. And, um, so, and Anwar, would you like to would you like to ask a question, please? Yeah, I think the most interesting thing for me, um, it's unfortunate that um, Jasmine's not here, but the sort of relationship between the three or four big communities of Singapore, um, Indian, Malay, Chinese, and then their interaction with the British arrival and the colonising 
mm-hmm. and the development of East India Company. Um, was there anything, but were there any tensions between the three communities at the station you picked up on? Hierarchies. I um, I didn't found anything about it. Again, Jasmine was more into it, yeah. but she did not mention anything about it. And as as far as I'm concerned, there's no um, reference to it. Also. Fascinating, but Singapore seen as a role model for integration of different communities in a really stable, uh, developed economic environment. So it'd be fascinating to look at the backstory. But yeah, it was great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, I think we've got a question have, has just come in the chat from uh, Tanya. So she said, I love the photos of the landscape and all the buildings. It would be so interesting to be able to take photos of the same places to show how the place has developed over time. Do you have any ideas of how you would like to add to the project? Yes, that's something interesting that I would like to discuss later, uh, if there should be some continuity to this, because Especially that part comparing actually uh, Jasmine, she does it with um, with the telegraph station. She picks a map and shows the old images of uh, the map and compares it with Google Maps and the way it is today. Um, and the photos was, well, it will take us more time to uh, understand exactly where it was, but I think it will be possible to do. That's something fun, interesting. Yes, thanks. Great, perfect, thanks so much. And um, actually I have one question if you don't mind. So um, I'm just interesting to, to know, um, I know that you were really keen with the film to have, to sort of show the archive and show the objects coming out of the boxes. And I was just wondering what your ideas were behind that. Oh, because we really wanted to, uh, I mean, the archive has so many things that I, I don't think that a lot of people are aware of that. And it, it um, makes you so many topics, like for instance, um, we've seen that all the groups have different topics and only in one archive and it shows that there's a lot to, to explore there. And that's what we aim to do is to show that where is the archive, how it works, uh, how things are um, categorized and how they work all they are kept and for me it's really it was really interesting because I didn't know how it worked so at least I have um, a glimpse of how it is. Perfect thanks so much and yeah hopefully one day you can come and visit Port Kana it'd be so great to show you around the archive in person. Thank you. Um, yeah so yeah thanks so much for the great talk and also for the film that was yeah that's yeah really really great and yeah i so enjoyed working on that film it was mm-hmm. a lot of fun um and so next um we will hear from anwar Akhtar, and he is the director of the samosa in london and who has been chairing a series of discussions and workshops with the students um including a captivating talk about the power of the English language and how this affects communication today. So some of the discussions um, during the project have explored identity, education, empire, trade, um, Commonwealth history, and including the collections of the Lahore Museum explored in the film uh, made by Anwar, which is Pakistan's best kept secret Lahore Museum. And if you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend it. We watched it on the project. And other workshops have also explored different elements of the British island story, uh, such as regional identity, class, um, history, empire, and the contribution of Britain's Spain communities to modern Britain. So today, um, Anwar will explore the relationship between Urdu, Punjabi, and English in Pakistan. Um, So Anwar, would you like to say a few words? And I believe, you'd like me to share a map as well. So I will do that um, as you start speaking. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. Um, it is still good morning. So good morning, everyone. And um, before I start, I just want to say it's been a real pleasure to work with a extraordinarily bright um, group of young people at varying degrees of um, 
so I know some are studying and some are working, but just um, yeah, a wonderful group of people, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And well done, Paul Colonel and um, Exeter University for pulling that partnership together. So I'm going to speak about um, Pakistan, specifically languages of uh, Pakistan. And, um, and here we have a map, um, wonderful. So the official state language of Pakistan, it's um, lingua franca alongside English, is Urdu. And Urdu as a language, has very deep historic roots in South Asia. It's um, developed as a Persianized sister tongue of Hindi from about sixth century onwards. Um, and it shares a common vocabulary based syntax with Hindi. And so Urdu and Hindi um, are mutually intelligible in colloquial speech, but they share different alphabets. Um, Sanskrit and Persian. And also the use of Urdu and Hindi today are deeply entwined with the identity politics and culture wars, if you like, between India and Pakistan following the 1947 partition. So if I just um, drill into the numbers around language. So the population of Pakistan is 225 million. I think um, the sixth most populated country on the planet. And so of a population of 225 million, 90% um, of the population of Pakistan don't speak Urdu as their first language, as their mother tongue. Um, their mother tongue, their language that they will grow up with in the family home, inherit from their parents, their indigenous language, if you like. Um, will be Punjabi, Sindhi, Baluchi, Pashtun, um, um, and then they will learn Urdu as a second language when they get into um, schooling. And so that raises a whole set of issues around um, regional cultural identity and social cohesion. And so, for instance, um, the largest ethnic group in Pakistan is Punjabi, and that's about 40% of the population and I'm descended from um, Pakistani um, um, immigrants that came to Britain in the 60s. So their first language is Punjabi. Um, the second most popular language um, in Pakistan is a very close tie between Pashto and Sindhi, both about 22, 23 million speakers. And then Saraki, which is actually a derivative of Punjabi, which is um, what my parents who came from Multan and Bahalpur speak. OK, so I, I mean, that's it on numbers for now. I'm just making the point that there are lots of languages in Pakistan. I think there's 60 or 70 different languages, seven or eight that are most dominant. And Urdu is not the most popular language in terms of indigenous speakers, but it's the national language of Pakistan. Um, now, before I get into the issues around Urdu's culture and heritage, if you're teaching a language in schools that is not mother tongue language when children come into schools, that raises all sorts of issues around um, cognitive understanding, a student's ability to um, develop conceptual clarity and expression at an early age, um, future academic utility, a student's ability to um, learn academic subjects, and unfamiliar languages, and a whole set of issues around development of co confidence, self-esteem, parental involvement in a child's education. Um, and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more shortly, but um, let me just park here that Pakistan has one of the worst levels of um, adult literacy on the planet. I think um, barely 46, 48% of women are literate, compared to 70% of men, and that's very basic literacy. Um, and there's all sorts of other educational problems in Pakistan. Before the pandemic, um, it was estimated that there were 22 million children not enrolled in school. Some think it's many more. Many of those are girls. There's difficult challenges around girls' education all across Pakistan, especially rural areas, because of... Um, all sorts of um, cultural traditions that are very, very difficult, um, to put it mildly. Um, so 
just hold that thought. Imagine if you grow up in the UK speaking English in the family home, and then you get to school and everything is going to be taught to you in French. That's the point I'm making um, about, you know, language issues around um, language and second um, language and mother tongue. Now, why um, and how this has happened, there's many different reasons, but one of the things I want you to just think about as well is the impact of partition on Pakistan around language and population growth and education. And if we just look at the story of Karachi, um, Pakistan's most populated city, in many ways its most important city strategically, culturally, economically, though not its capital now. Pakistan um, came into being in 1947, the partition of India. Karachi's population then was half a million, 500,000 people or thereabouts. The vast majority of Karachi's population would have been Sindhi and Baluchi um, speaking um, people. By 1951, within four years, the population of Karachi went from 500,000 to a million. Um, now, take a similar sized city in the UK, say Liverpool or Sheffield, um, two great cities I'm quite familiar with. Imagine if Liverpool or Sheffield's population doubled in four years, and it doubled with people whose first language wasn't English. And that's what happened in Karachi. The, Urdu speaking refugees, Muslim refugees from all over India, many came to Karachi, they're called Mahajas, many of them were part of India's Muslim elite, incredibly entrepreneurial, incredibly talented, many were poor and working class, uh, and as they came to Karachi, their mother tongue, Urdu, um, then had a tension with Sindhi and Baluchi, and many of the um, tensions in Karachi are around control between different communities of one of the most valuable port cities, trading cities, mercantile cities on the South Asian Gulf Coast. Um, but just coming back um, to language um, and where language is in Pakistan, um, Karachi um, ended up not being the capital. A new capital was built in Islamabad and primarily because of an attempt to have a Punjabi language um, dominance. Um, and then language in Pakistan, um, I'm slightly stopping and thinking out loud because this goes in so many different directions around the challenges of Pakistan. Um, so when Pakistan was created, the selection of Urdu was due to its association with um, South Asian Muslim nationalism, the incredible rich literary, cultural, cultural um, traditions of Urdu across poetry, across arts, um, its links with um, the Mughals and uh, Persian culture, Persian Asian culture. So there's a huge, very rich, powerful um, Muslim cultural identity wrapped up in Urdu. And you can understand why Pakistan, uh, as a South Asian Muslim nation, wanted a unifying national language, um, one that promoted um, a sort of Muslim cultural excellence. So, I mean, that's understandable, but then you've got to think about, um, as Pakistan was created, there was East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, where the majority obviously spoke Bengali, and Urdu wasn't their um, natural mother tongue. And that explains a great deal of the awful events that led to um, the um, creation of Bangladesh in terms of the violence with an attempt to impose Urdu on an entire people where it wasn't their mother tongue. Now, goodness me, there's so many issues here. So Article 251 of the Constitution of Pakistan declares that there can only be one official language at the national level, um, although in reality there's two because English is spoken by all the business, academic, military elites. Eventually, um, the Constitution was amended to allow Punjabi provisional language, um, a provisional language status in the Punjab. Now that's half the um, population of Pakistan's mother tongue um, being seen as a uh, provincial language. Uh, in a way, as a Brit and having grown up looking at the experiences of um, Latin 
in European education being seen as a language of excellence, but not people's mother tongue and educational elites. And that's a very crass comparison, but I think there are some similarities there. But um, it's just this idea that when you build a nation, you're building it around language and the relationship between that and mother tongue. And this also plays into issues around Afghanistan today. So uh, Pashto is a very widely spoken language um, all across Pakistan. There's been great um, Pashto migration into Karachi, huge community, Lahore, Islamabad, after Punjabi is perhaps the most dominant um, community in many ways in um, Pakistan. Um, but their language, um, Pashto, um, is not Urdu. Um, and um, there's also, I mean, uh, Sereki is a wonderful um, derivative of Punjabi um, spoken in Multan and Bahalpur, which I'm extraordinarily fond of because that's my parents' mother tongue that I inherited speaking. And that's a very different language from Urdu as well. Um, and so, and he's spoken by about 20 million people. I mean, going back to Afghanistan and the, the Afghanistan border now, um, the Duran line, the 2,670 kilometer border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, originally established um, in 1893 by a chap called Mortimer Durand, um, another one of these um, intrepid British and um, Victorian empire building explorers that left his mark on um, maps of the world and cartography. And the Durand line was originally a deal between uh, the British um, controlling India and Abdul Rahman Khan, the Afghan Empire, to fix their respective um, spheres of influence. And it left half of the natural Pashtun homelands under British rule, half in Afghanistan. And of course, that then followed through with the creation of Pakistan. And it was all part of the great game of uh, a buffer zone between British and Russian interests in the region. And so the Duran line was inherited by Pakistan in 1947 and is challenged by uh, many um, people, particularly in Afghanistan. And again, that's about language and how language plays out. But let me just wrap up very quickly with a few things. Um, it is a generally professionally accepted view that one of the biggest challenges in Pakistan is the failure to engage with mother tongue and literacy and education and mass education. That I see as a bigger challenge to Pakistan are sectarian violence, gender inequality and poverty. Um, but because of the very delicate fault lines around identity and national pride, people are uh, tread very cautiously. But there is a real willingness, I think, or wish to engage with the relationship between mother tongue and Urdu as the kind of South Asian Muslim language. Um, I'll wrap up very quickly with, uh, um, I've used reference to Pakistan a lot because it's such a large country and it's so culturally strategically important, and also it's linked to Britain. There's two views you can take on Pakistan, um, and I take one of the two views, depending which day of the week you get me on, and what mood I'm in. So my, you know, one view is that it's a country that is just an amazingly extraordinary achievement of the human spirit that has survived so long, with so many um, tensions against it, and with such conflict with India, so a brilliant, extraordinary achievement, resilience, amazing people, amazing culture, amazing belief. Um, there's another view that it's creaking under the weight of its own contradictions and it risks becoming a failed state, despite the brilliance of its people, its diaspora and the vast culture it's inherited and it's part of. Um, it's sometimes said that there's three things that unite Pakistan. Um, I think I've pointed out that language isn't one of them by now. The three things that unite Pakistan are cricket, very important, religion, and animosity towards India. So, you know, you could say three of the pillars. So if you take those three things, cricket is wonderful. Can you build a nation around it? I love cricket, so let me just park that issue there. Um, building nations around religion, Islam, and unity, well, have a look at um, Northern Ireland and Ireland and the European experience, and you can see the tensions there. And I think there does become a point where the Pakistani establishment should perhaps um, stop blaming India for everything 
um, which is often a default setting. Um, I'm going to start by saying there's a new national school curriculum that's been launched a great fanfare by Imran Khan. It seems to adopt the biggest crisis or the biggest challenge around curriculum in education in Pakistan, which is a relationship between mother tongue, the working class communities of Pakistan, rote learning, Urdu, and literacy and economic educational marginalization. Um, not the first time the Pakistani establishment have dealt a big challenge. Thank you. Great, Anwar, thank you so much. So I think you've already touched on this, um, but if you wanted to expand yeah. on any of these questions. So yeah, regarding how language is used for nation building and the tensions this can lead to, um, are there examples in Europe that are similar to what you have discussed regarding Pakistan? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, as a Brit, I suppose the two obvious ones are um, the huge um, defensiveness of uh, kind of choosing my words very carefully here, because I don't, you know, but the, the, the defensiveness in Belfast, in Northern Ireland, from very staunch loyalist Protestant communities at any intimation of um, Gaelic or Irish going into the curriculum. Because th there's a fear there, isn't there? There's a fear of a Trojan horse that's going to lead to a united Ireland and affect. And I often think, you know, the relationship between Northern Ireland and uh, Ireland is a bit like the relationship between India and Pakistan or Scotland and England, perhaps. And I think the issue is that there is no doubt um, Urdu is incredibly important for Pakistan in terms of its cultural traditions, its literary traditions, its heritage, South Asian Muslim identity. But Urdu for many people in Pakistan is seen as an elite language of academics. It is the indigenous um, Muslim mother tongue of uh, Delhi and parts of, you know, and uh, the indigenous mother tongue of um, Lahore, the other great kind of, um, city of the Punjab, if you like, um, or mobile city, is Punjabi. So putting, so it's very, so you can see why, and you know, if you've just been created as a nation, and you've got four or five provinces that are very, very different, Baluchistan, Punjab, Sindh, um, Khyber Pakhtun, the awful conflicts with Bangladesh, you've got to have some unifying thing, a unifying, something that holds a nation together. And so the two things are going to be religion, um, and language. Now we see with religion all the strife between different communities. With language, um, we, you know, what I didn't think they thought through the fact that if you're not teaching children's education in their mother tongue, but you're making them learn Urdu as a language of schools and the language of curriculum. I mean, imagine being Portuguese and getting to primary school. We'd say, right, it's all French now. Everything's French. That's the language of Europe. You know, that, I mean, that's the kind of model that Pakistan's got into. Um, but because there's so many religious um, sensitivities around it, it's very difficult to reform the curriculum in Pakistan. They urgently need to reform on this issue. It's not a niche subject. We're talking about 60, 70 million children, you know, millions out of school and the issues in that region. So, yeah, it's, um, that's what I wanted to drill into more. Great, so thanks so much, Anna. That's really interesting. We've just had an anonymous question come in. Oh, go for it. So um, how do you see the relationship between language and social, social class in Pakistan? Is one's class or language more important in defining you or are they inextricably linked? Okay, so, I mean, again, as a Brit that spent a lot of time in Pakistan, one of the things that really... It is a bit, I mean, I'm going to be really careful there because I don't want to get accused of Orientalism, but it does sometimes feel like you're walking through a Dickens novel, you know, with the class divide. So there is an elite of Pakistan, I and mean, there's several elites. There's the economic elite, the cultural elite, the military elite, but there's a 10, 15% of Pakistan's um, population that are very articulate in English. The wealthy will educate their kids in Harvard or Berkeley or Westminster or Oxbridge. Uh, Emirun Khan's a great example of that. And it's, an, it's, an, it's a sort of elite rich tribe that effortlessly slip across borders and, you know, um, five star kind of that five star world. And then there's the kind of military establishment, which is a huge institution in Pakistan um, that 
is omnipresent in terms of the nation's structures. And again, and I, and I think those elites will be very, very conversant in Urdu and English. But then the working classes that speak Sindhi, that speak Baluchi, that speak Punjabi, you're dealing with, you know, often large rural or uh, peasant communities or large urban communities that are utterly disenfranchised. And the disconnect between the two is jaw dropping compared to the experience I've had growing up in Britain of um, integration and representation and roots into, you know, we have ways for everyone involved in this panel can in some way make a connection with, um, so every British person involved in this panel will have access to the British establishment via vice chancellors, universities, trustees of boards, um, politicians. That doesn't exist in Pakistan. So there's a disconnect between the elites and the mass population. And I think the language issue, and I think there is a, I think there is a language apartheid. If you don't speak Urdu or English, if you're speaking Punjabi or Sindhi or Baluchi, um, yeah, you will be, you, you lower down the cultural hierarchy. Great, Anwar, thanks so much. That's so interesting. And uh, Root V and Hannah explore yeah. that later in a film that they... Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. really that. exciting. And so we have one more question um, come in from Stuart in the chat. So I'll just read that out for you if you wouldn't mind, Anwar. So it's, um, would you see any parallels between Pakistan and the drive for Scottish independence? No, um, I see, I'm going to be... Um... No, I see parallels. I see lots of parallels between Pakistan and Israel. And I think that's a more helpful comparison. Um, both countries are the same age, born in 1947. Both came out of British mandates at the end of empire. Um, both have a narrative where um, there's a narrative of having been wronged and being disenfranchised in Pakistan with millions and millions of, well, tens of millions of people, my parents, my mother included, that were refugees that had to flee and were expelled from India. Um, and there's the narrative of uh, Israeli marginalization and people fleeing Europe. There's also a narrative of, of course, wanting to ignore the fact that many Hindus and Muslims had to flee Pakistan and go to India. So there's a narrative of only seeing one side of the dispossession and not the other. And I'm sure Palestinians will say the same thing. Both countries have got ridiculously loyal diasporas. My God, the Pakistani diaspora would give the Israel. I mean, have a look at the cricket, have a look at the, you know, the, the loyalty of the pa I mean, it's often said that one of Pakistan's best assets is its diaspora, um, because it is just knee-jerk loyalty, knee-jerk. Uh, and understandable is its family, its heritage, its culture. Both are nuclear powers, both got massive military establishments, and both would say they're in difficult neighbourhoods with issues to resolve. Um, but I think, you know, when you build a nation in the name of one minority or one community, immediately the question arises, what about all the other communities? And what about all the other minorities? And I think that's an issue in Pakistan. Um, I think Scotland is, uh, there's a bit of a comparison between, I think there's a English Scotland. I, I think there's a, India, Pakistan's a bit like England, Scotland. Yeah, you know, I, I see that you know, in terms of, you know, there was an idea that Pakistan was gonna be federal, but there would always be that, you know, link with India. And unfortunately, it hasn't quite worked out that way because of the horrors of partition. So, I, yeah, let me stop there. Great, Anwar, thank you so much. That's yeah, really interesting. And um, yeah, Charlotte has just mentioned saying that it's really interesting thinking about the importance of language with regards to identity and national pride. And she also draws um, on something that, yeah, Rutfi and Hannah will bring up later, which is the links between the telegraph and the spread of English as an area not much studied as yet. And so yeah, after Ian's wonderful talk, which we're gonna um, hear from next, we will, we will hear from Rutfi and Hannah. But yeah, thank you so much, Anwar. Thank you. Great. And um, yeah, so next we have Ian Tawanda-Magar talking about the Telegraph and the extension of the British Empire in Zimbabwe. Ian is studying archaeology, museum and heritage studies at Great Zimbabwe University. He was partnered with Libby, um, who at the last minute was unable to attend today. Ian's work focuses on Zimbabwe and the impact of telegraphy there. 
Um, and the museum at Porthcarno focuses um, primarily on undersea telegraphy. And therefore, there was only a few documents pertaining to the history of overland telegraphy in, Z in Zimbabwe. And therefore, in research is an invaluable contribution to the Porthcarno archive. And he has written a fascinating blog, which is available on the Porthcarno website, using very interesting images that he has found in collections in Zimbabwe and, and in the Porthcarno archive. And his work truly shows the nature of this project of combining PK archive material with material elsewhere. So Ian has um, pre-recorded his talk due to some internet issues which sometimes occur in our group meetings. Um, but before I play the talk, um, Ian, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, I'm Ian Tawanda Mugua from Zimbabwe, studying archaeology, museums, and heritage studies at Great Zimbabwe University. Uh, I did a research on the history of telegraphy in Zimbabwe. Telegraphy is a tool of imperialism and also the African resistance to the foreign technology. Um, my talk is about the uh, telegraph and the extension of the British Empire. So may I hand over to you, Alice, then you can share the talk. Great, perfect. Thanks so much. I'll share it now. I'm Ian Tawanda Mugua from Great Zimbabwe University. Today I'm going to talk about the telegraphy and the extension of the British Empire. Constraints of time, I'm not going to be much detailed, but I'll just try so that each and everyone can get an appreciation of the history of telegraphy in Zimbabwe. Well, the ordinary interpretation or explanation of the history of telegraphy is about communication. Within the African context, Telegraph is well explained as a line of communication at a greater distance. And this foreign technology was first to be seen on the Zimbabwean land around 1890, and it was for the British use only. Telegraph was very instrumental in the extension of the British Empire. Yeah, one may ask how. Well, during the time of scramble and partition of Africa, there was competition for land between the British, Portuguese, among others. Therefore, Cecil John Rhodes, the British imperialist who was in charge for the colonization of the Southern Africa, noted that an effective communication was the key in quenching his imperial test, and he engineered the formation of African Transcontinental Telegraph Company. And this was an effort to fulfill his dream to conquer from Cape to Cairo. Telegraph lines acted as territorial marker. The construction of telegraph lines in the Southern Africa made the British South African Company to win the land over the Portuguese. This implies that in areas where there were telegraph lines and stations, the British South African Company was in charge and all control powers was in their hands. Therefore, no any other foreigner could claim land. But the Africans were not in a position to lose their land and there was a strong African resistance to the foreign technology uh, from 1892 to 1896. In 1891, councillors or indunas of King Lobengula, the king of Ndebele in Blawayo, suspected some dark ulterior design behind the extension of the British from the south, and they blotted out their suspicions by declaring that the British were bringing wire to tie up their king. They shook their heads when the real and actual purpose of telegraph was explained. Lobengula appears to have prohibited his people from stealing copper wire from telegraph by announcing to Ndebele people when the telegraph lines was being erected, no person would be able to pass underneath it without being killed. But the writ of King Lobengula was ineffective in neighboring Mashona land. Lobengula was responsible for raids in Mashona land, and the Shona people denied him as their king, but their enemy. Shona people not only were disappointed to find that the British magic had no effect upon their enemies, but also saw the copper wire as too tempting not to be refashioned into ornaments. 
and it eventually led to the Anglo Nibelo of 1893 to 1894. The telegraph wire were frequently stolen by the locals to make bangles, snares for trapping game. Chief Gomala resisted European occupation by repeatedly cutting telegraph wires between present day Mashingo and Blawayo. The European settler responded by fining Chief Gomala for the offense. Chief Gomala was requested to hand over Keto, which he, he said were his but had been left in his safekeeping by King Lobengula. Chief Gomala then sent a word to King Lobengula saying that the British had stolen the Keto. This in turn started a chain of events that contributed to the onset of the 1893 Anglo Nebelewo. When Lobengula sent soldiers to punish the Shona in question, the British South African Company treated this as an invasion of their territory. The Ndebele were subjected to a too prolonged attack by the British South African Company for forces from Mashona land and Imperial forces from Botswana. So the contemporary colonial explanation was that the Ndebele were terribly afraid of the telegraph wire and hesitated to go near it, much more to attempt to cut it. The telegraphic communication technology was much resisted in Mashona land and the chiefs were strongly against the imperial government and its telegraph development. So comparing the two major ethnic ethnical groups in Zimbabwe which are the Ndebele and the Shona. The telegraph technology was much resisted in Mashonal inside than in Ndebele in the Ndebele area. Ian thank you so much uh, such a great talk and I just love how you tell such a captivating story of the impact of communication in Zimbabwe and um, Gareth, I wanted to ask you um, if, if you had any questions for Ian, please. Ian, a very interesting talk, actually. Did, when the telegraph wires were installed, did they, what was the terrain that they had to work over? Was it very remote locations? Was it a difficult uh, exercise to install the telegraph in Zimbabwe? Yeah, it was very difficult for them because of the, the, geograph the geographical mm. structure of Zimbabwean land. And they would employ 200 to 500 men and they could work only meters a day. With that's a huge number of up to 500 workers. Yeah. Yes. I think it, it's, it's very interesting when you look through the history of the in, installation of the telegraph in remote areas as to how demanding it was. I mean, the, the story of crossing Australia, going from Darwin to Adelaide, was a, a absolutely fascinating story, really, really challenging. And... Um, so I can imagine that you would have quite difficulties in, in dealing with that geography or the terrain. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Gareth, thanks so much. Yeah, Al, would you like to ask a question, please? Yeah, thank you. Ian, that was great, really enjoyable. Thank you. Um, I'm just, you know, the um infrastructure, the infrastructure that's been left, you know, the cables and the kind of stations, is that still visible in Zimbabwe today in the, in the way that in India and Pakistan, the railways and the canals are very much seen as a legacy of the British presence. And for good and for bad, because they were, they brought benefits, but they also took out a lot of wealth. And, you know, and likewise, what's the feeling today in Zimbabwe about the impact of the cable and telegraphy? Well, they are still invisible, but now they are under tier one, which runs the telephone. They were transformed from telegraphic technology to telephone. Uh, mm -hmm. Interesting. 
thank you. So, so it was commercialized by private players in the communication cycle. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Ian. It's yeah, so interesting. And definitely check out Ian's blog. It's I put a link to it um in the chat here and he's used yeah such great imagery in it and it's written so well so yeah thank you so much ian um and charlotte has um written in the chat that it's really interesting to hear of the local people's fear of the telegraph wires landline telegraphy is not much referred to in the pk archive so this is a this research is a great addition to our knowledge um thank you ian for sharing this with us so Ian, would you like to, to elaborate at all on how you talk about how local people um, like fear of the telegraph wires? Sorry. As, you would you like, again? you talked in your talk, you mentioned about how local people were um, like feared the telegraph wires. Would you like to add anything else to that? Uh, no. Perfect. Great. Well, thanks so much. It was, yeah, so interesting. And um, so last but not least, um, I'm very excited to introduce um, the final two students um, to share their work. So Hannah Reeves and Root V Narag. And Root V is based in India and is a recent graduate in chemical engineering from ITT Bombay. And Hannah is a recent graduate of Modern Languages from Exeter University and is about to embark on an MA, which I believe is in Medieval Studies. Um, and they are both interested in language. And when searching through the PK Archive database, uh, we searched for the word linguistics and came across a map titled Linguistic Map of the World and it was a Marconi code map showing the dominant languages used in telegraphy in the early um, 20th century. And this spurred their interest in language and communication, leading to a film titled um, India Then and Now, which explores communication between India and the UK and the power of the English language. And they have shown great perseverance in researching this topic, which was so broad. And they have done a brilliant job of bringing their ideas together and creating this wonderful film. So the film was produced, narrated, researched and scripted by Hannah and Rootby. And the video was by Luca Salvagno with music by Annabelle Hockey Smith. So before I share the film, over to Hannah and Rootby to introduce the film, please. Thank you. I think Alice has mostly introduced us and the project, but I'll just give a brief overview before, before we start the film. So as she said, we were matched as a pair um, at the start of the project due to a shared interest in, in language and linguistics. Um, and our main aim was sort of trying to find a link to language in the archive, which initially proved quite difficult, um, which could be kind of surprising because it's a museum about communication, but uh, Anwar's lectures were very useful in giving us some focus and ideas and discussion of sort of thinking where we could take the project. Um, as Alice said, our research initially took us by searching linguistics to the Marconi map, which was something that particularly fascinated me. It was actually the advert for the symposium, so you may have seen the map already. Um, and as she said, it's a map of the world, which is color coded to show the language most commonly used in wireless telegraphy in each country. So it's kind of a snapshot into the dominant language, certainly in kind of administration and communication in those countries, which is very interesting from a, the point of view of colonialism. So it's unsurprising, perhaps, but also interesting that the only languages on there are English, French, Spanish, German, Russian, Japanese, Portuguese, and Dutch. So there's a high level of correlation between the colonized nations and the language of, of the oppressors. Um, yeah, I found this map really fascinating. I wrote a blog post about it 
that talked a bit about what I've mentioned and also looked at the Marconi International Code, which was one of the codes used in wireless telegraphy. Uh, and these are in huge volumes stored in the archive, which show the code for each word and phrase, and it's the same in every, every language. Um, but as Alice said, through kind of discussions, we decided for our main project, we would like to focus on language in India and the spread of the English language related to telegraphy. Um, as that's where Rootby is from. And through our discussions together, we I found it really interesting hearing her talk about the language situation in India, how English functions in different parts of society. So we decided to make a video about that and link it to the archive at Paul Kerno. The link to telegraphy is that increased communications and faster links due to the telegraph system would have been a factor in the spread of English in the country. Um, as I think Charlotte said, it's not something that's massively been researched and documented, so it was hard to find evidence explicitly for that link. But I think we can assume that that was significant, that communication and increased links did have an impact. Um, so even though you can't really quantify it. In the video, I talk a bit about the history of telegraphy in India and the role of English, and Rootby talks about the language landscape there today. And I'll hand over to her if she would like to have anything. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rudvi. I think what the project encapsulates has been sort of covered by both Alice and Hannah, who've done that, who've done that brilliant job of just summarizing what we discuss in the video. Um, I think as Charlotte mentioned in her comment, I think the video would address uh, this this lack of research on this on this topic, and and I think just our conversations with Anwar have been so helpful. Um, the topic of the language landscape in Pakistan that Anwar just discussed, I think all of you will be able to draw lots of parallels between between that in terms of just how there how there are language elites or social elites and cultural elites that exists both in, you know, as Anwar said in Pakistan, but all of that concept can be sort of drawn parallels from India as well. Um, and I really sort of like the whole concept of language just unifying the nation. In specific to India, I think uh, each where each state has its own language, I think just that having like one or two, some languages that 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 become like a major lingua franca for the country become super important. So um, yeah, I think I let the video speak for itself, but I do want to just sort of talk a little bit about how an engineering student ended up uh, and having that curiosity around the concept of languages, right? So um, I have always been interested in literature and I ended up taking a linguistics course in my final year. So that, in, that in, in itself ignited my curiosity to sort of learn about languages in a social context and how it impacts society on, on the whole and not just technical aspects of languages. So um, I think it in the, basically I would say that while, you know, just topics like linguistic aspects of colonialism are really complex topics, but they speak about how language of the colonizer or the ruler is favored over that of the colony and how it can lead to a feeling of loss of identity and culture amongst the inhabitants of the colony. So I think in the Indian context, it would mean that languages such as Persian, which became a major language at the time of Mughal rule in India, uh, following which India was colonized by England and that led to a prominent status of English language in India. Um, my personal interest in two languages, I think, looking back, dates even, even back. When I was in school, um, we had this chapter in my English textbook called The Last Lesson. It was a fictional story of a boy living in a small district in France at the time of the Franco-Prussian War. The boy basically disliked studying and, and hated his French teacher. However, one day he realizes that as an outcome of the war, Germany has ordered that German language will replace French instruction in his school. And that is when that realization strikes him that he can no longer study his native language and the loss of identity, right? So I think this story in itself left an lasting impact in me. And 
I think that is where just my curiosity about linguistics and the impact of language started. Um, in our project, uh, we have looked at the impact of telegraph linkage between England and India. We've also talked about the language landscape of, in, of India in itself and the relationship between English and the Indian languages. And um, I think it's, it's basically we've also discussed the, this evolving relationship between England and India. First, we are colonization and now as independent nations. Um, given this background, I'll just let the video, uh, yeah, see its way through. Great, thank you for such great introductions. Um, yeah, I'm so excited to share this film. Um, yeah, so enjoy. With a population of over 1.3 billion, India is a rich and diverse country, culturally, socially, and linguistically a reflection of its history and past influences. This short film will take you to the realms of time when the telegraphy link was established between India and England and discuss how English in India has evolved over time. It also encapsulates the language landscape of India and reflects on the relationship between English and the Indian languages. Although only around 10% of Indians speak English, that counts up to a massive 125 million English speakers, making it the second largest English speaking population in the world. The status of English as one of the two official languages reflects its importance, especially in business and administration. Paul Kernow, June the 7th, 1870. A cable is brought ashore that would soon form part of the first submarine cable linking England and India, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. Laid on the seabed, the route went from Porthcurno to Carcavelos, Gibraltar, Malta, Alexandria, Suez, Aden, and finally Bombay. The Indian Mutiny of 1857 had demonstrated the need for rapid communication with India via a network under England's control as at that time it took a month to send a message from London to Bombay. In 1865, a step had been made with the first overland telecommunication link between Europe and India, but it was still uncertain and unreliable. With the new Red Sea Line of 1870, a message could arrive in mere minutes. In fact, at a party celebrating the opening of the cable, guests were invited to send messages to Bombay and see responses arrive within 15 minutes. At the telegraph station in Bombay, messages could be sent on to other parts of India using the overland telegraph system developed by Dr. William O'Shaughnessy, known as the father of electric telegraph in India. As India's link to Britain and the rest of the empire, Bombay was an important hub of communications and of vital importance for Britain. The telegraph station there also represented a mixing of East and West with workers from different parts of the world in the early days, telegraph operation engineers had to be trained in England before going to work in India, so there were many British workers, as well as other Europeans and local Indian workers. With its telegraph cables snaking out under the sea, Britain had pulled its colonies closer. Easier and faster means of communication enabled Britain to exercise greater control, politically, economically, but also linguistically. Like how the internet and mass media is aiding the diffusion of English today, the telegraph would have also impacted the spread of English in the 19th century. As the Marconi map shows, English was the main language of telegraphy in many parts of the world, including India, and is likely to have been commonly used in telegraph stations like the one in Bombay, cementing its use in the civil service and in education. Although the telegraph network was by no means the only factor in the diffusion of English in India, leading to its status in 1947 as the only functional lingua franca in the country, it undoubtedly had an impact as it meant that there was increased contact and communication between England and India. The intermingling of English and Indian workers at the telegraph stations would have also furthered the spread of English through the population. The diffusion of English even went as far as names, 
Accounts suggest that several Indian senders adopted common English names like Peter and John, as they believed that more attention was paid to the correct transmission of messages to Europeans. Inevitably, the prevalence of English in the telegraph industry and administration came as a cost for Indian languages, like Hindi, Bengali and many others. Though India became an independent nation on August 15, 1947, it declared itself a sovereign, democratic and republic state with the adoption of the constitution on January 26, 1950. The Indian constitution envisaged that English would be phased out in favour of Hindi over a 15-year period but gave parliament the power to provide for the continued use of English even thereafter. Plans to make Hindi the sole official language of the Republic were met with resistance, given the plethora of languages used in various parts of the country. While there is no one Indian language, both Hindi and English are declared as the national official languages to be used for official written purposes throughout the country. Looking back, two contact languages have played a crucial role in the history of India. Persian and English. Persian was the court language during the Mughal period in India. It reigned as an administrative language for several centuries until the era of British colonization. Today, India is well known for its rich linguistic diversity and rightly so. To put things into context, India is home to speakers of about 461 languages of which 447 are actively used in daily communication. Amongst these, 121 languages have more than 10,000 speakers each and 22 of these are officially recognized in the Indian constitution. Almost every state in India has its own language. Maharashtra has Marathi, West Bengal Bengali, Punjabi is spoken in Punjab and Kannada in Karnataka and so on. These languages can further have multiple dialects and often have their own script. Being the mother tongue of approximately 43.6% citizens, Hindi serves as the lingua franca across much of North and Central India. However, Fewer people speak and understand Hindi as you travel further south, which is dominated by the Dravidian languages. The language landscape in India, as you can see, is quite complex. Most people in India are multilingual or bilingual at the least. A child belonging to a Bengali family living in the state of Gujarat would converse in Bengali at home speak the local language Gujarati with their neighbours and friends and study Hindi and English at school. Hindi is derived from the family of Indo-Aryan languages that are all ultimately derived from Latin and Greek. Thus, English, Hindi, Bangla, Dutch, German and French are all distant cousins. Contrary to English, where the pronunciation of certain words does not strictly follow the written form, Hindi is a phonetic language. Each word is pronounced according to its spelling. This makes the language easier to pronounce since it follows the written form all the time. As a continuously evolving language, English has borrowed many words from Indian languages, especially during the British colonization of India. For example, Jungle, Bandana, Pajama are all adopted to English from Hindi. An interesting example is that of Shampoo, which became a part of the English language in the 18th century. The word Shampoo is derived from the Hindi word Champo, which means to squeeze, knead or massage. In Britain, the term and the concept was introduced by a Bengali trader who along with his wife opened a shampooing bath in Brighton in 1814. Similarly, the word bangle is derived from the Hindi word bangri, which originally meant coloured glass ring ornaments worn on the wrist by Indian women. In India, English fluency is considered socially prestigious and important for job success and upward mobility. But, 
Acquiring fluent English requires rich and consistent language exposure, which unfortunately is accessible to only upper middle and upper class families in India. Together, this desire to speak fluent English combined with the inaccessibility to do so leads to a hybrid language that combines words and sentences from both languages only for conversational purposes. English, as we call it, is an amalgamation of Hindi and English within a conversation or even individual sentences. For instance, a English speaker would say, "Pichle kuch saalon mein the number of unicorns emerging in India has been on a rise," which translates to, "In recent years, the number of unicorns emerging from India has been on a rise." At the same time, there are Indianisms. words or phrases which are characteristic of indian english these are at times grammatically incorrect literal translation from hindi and widely used what is your good name myself raj are some common indianisms one indianism though that actually makes logical sense is prepone the opposite of postpone thus from the lens of languages the impact of english on indian languages and vice versa has been enormous the relationship between india and england over the centuries has been a close one and was clearly reinforced by the physical link of the telegraph cables and the communication that it allowed today their relationship remains close but more equal now that they are both separate independent nations Instead of telegraph messages, the internet provides rapid communication between the two countries, and links are reinforced by trade deals, diplomatic missions, and migration. The rise of India as a powerful global economy and the world's largest democracy could, in the near future, even see it rival the power of its former oppressor. Wow, thank you so much for the an outstanding film and bringing together so many images and it's so interesting to hear about you know the power of the English language and how Anwar's talks have inspired these ideas. Um yeah, so on that note Anwar, would you like to ask a question to Hannah and Ruth Lee please? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's lot there's lots to, <laughs> lots to pick. Well, I mean firstly well done. Well done. It's really to get that much complex information over in 10 11 minutes is the film is i mean you you have to filter and leave a lot out yeah and uh, that's a really good skill so well done um yeah i'd be interested in um yeah a question to you both um you know how urdu has there's a hierarchy in india with english and urdu are you saying this, that's not quite the same in India because there's so many other you know is it is what's the relationship between Hindi and Punjabi in India equals or all right so i can dig that up i come from a punjabi family personally yes. and um so we basically uh, i i do not know any punjabi at all no. I can I can understand the language, but I cannot speak it. Uh -huh. My grandparents, uh, that their generation, when they speak with their friends or their, you know, their parents, etc., that is when they actually use Punjabi. Uh -huh. um, most of, uh, even though even though I am Punjabi, I don't speak the language, right? Uh -huh. But then, if you go further to, so now I currently live something. further east to delhi mm -hmm. uh, so that is like central north of india if you look at punjab that is where most of people who speak punjabi would reside right so then those the, the religion essentially would be sikh and not just punjabi uh, that is that is the community who mostly speaks punjabi um and then i personally i don't think i think there's uh, between the languages hindi and punjabi there's no hierarchy as such of course there are many more hindi speakers than punjabi speakers but i think punjabi just as a form of you know if you just look at 
um the the mass commercial movies that that come out or the or, or the complete content the 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 punjabi songs are really really popular in india uh, the punjabi movies or even the use of some punjabi phrases in, in traditional hindi movies is also very common so i think i i particularly do not see any hierarchy as such but i see like a really good intermingling of languages and what about yeah. urdu and hindi is what's the relationship between urdu and hindi now all right so i cannot speak for the muslim population of course um personally my experience has been uh that me and most of you know my friends who are interested in literature that is when they actually really look up to urdu right the urdu poets the urdu uh, just writers that is when we actually go and uh, sort of look look at that literature in its entirety um and yeah it's it's really considered at least you know amongst us my friends mm. and all of our community it's just considered like as a really good rich language um yeah but then again not accessible to everyone um yeah i mean i personally have this huge uh, inclination towards just the romanticism around urdu literature mm. and that is where i come from yeah, yeah. hana were you so one last question hana were you surprised at how powerful english is in india still yeah i think so almost well sort of in a contradictory way i was surprised yeah. how powerful it was despite how few people despite how few people speak it uh uh-huh. that makes sense so kind of its status in the country and its use among the elite and administration mm-hmm. and government and things like that um but the fact that as we said only 10% of people in india speak it so there's a clear kind of discrepancy in like divide there i guess which must 10% of india is a lot though <laughs> yeah a lot of people but like kind yeah. of proportionately yeah. um and i wonder if that leads to yeah. kind of class divisions and and things like that oh yes yeah. thank you thank you great thanks so much and um oh yeah gara great um do you have a question and then i'll i think nadia has raised her hand for a question as well might um <clears throat> yeah just if just a point of interest really was that on our 150th anniversary of the arrival of the cable between um Port Kerno and Bombay um we did contact the Indian High Commission in London about the possibility of having a a celebration between Port Kerno and Bombay and in fact just before the G7 conference came to Cornwall we did have a visit uh from the high commissioner and the deputy high commissioner and they came down to um to Port Kerno we had these two big diplomatic cars which drove up in front of the museum um and we had a good meeting and with the idea that we would look at some form of joint celebration but of course sadly the crisis over covid-19 took over and uh, we won't be able to do anything now but we did establish a good link and it's likely that we will follow that up in the future when it's safe to do so Great. really glad to hear that great gareth thank you so much that's so interesting and yeah i remember that happening it was very exciting and um yeah nadia you raised your hand would you like to ask a question please yes please my um question is mostly for rutvi because i i'm curious about one thing um I believe that Marathi is considered to be an Indo-Aryan language. Marathi. And yeah. um even though it's in central India and all in and in Goa uh, that is nearby people mm-hmm. speak Konkani that is considered yeah. to be a dialect of, Mar- of Maratha. And all the children that I met there they were teaching in school there were several language options but most of them were teaching english some of them chose french maratha but indo was not normally an option and 
my question is that you think that uh, due to into the movement, it will be a more tendency for people to speak Hindi, even in the places that it's not so common? Or do you think that uh, English will remain as um, a lingua franca? So um, I think that's a really good question. Uh, the point to, um, it's so, so essentially, if I just sort of give you some context, I live in Haryana, so that's close to Delhi. I used to study in Bombay. Um, and, and then my university is such that there are students from all around India. So now when you, and that is the first time I was interacting with South Indians, right? And the, and the reason I mention is this is because a lot of times uh, my friends from South India could not speak Hindi. So we used to, we had to converse in English. That was the only option, right? So, um, and we mentioned this in our video as well, that only 40, around 40% 40 of Indians speak Hindi, but that's still like the, the major language. So essentially it's very fragmented, the language landscape in itself. Um, and then to your point of just in future, would Hindi then be sort of like a unifying language? I don't think so because um, recently we had this, uh, so in 2020, we, uh, in the government released this national education policy in which there's an emphasis on, uh, on, you know, schools actually teaching the, the, uh, the local language. So, because there was like a loss of local language teaching throughout the country. So now the government has emphasized that, yes, it's important that, okay, so if you're speaking a language at your home, if you live in Gujarat and your parents talk in Gujarati, you speak Gujarati at home, but then you don't even learn the language in school, that doesn't make sense. And you suddenly have to speak like a new language, uh, read a new language in school, right? So essentially schools are now focusing more on uh, having that one language that is the local language and the second language be either Hindi or English or both as well. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Thank you. You really answered my question. Yes. <laughs> All right. Hey, thank you so much. That was yeah, such a great question. So um, we have a, a question from Charlotte, and she says that Anwar mentioned that you had to leave out a lot of research in order to reduce the length of the film. And she asked, what research would you most like to mention that you did not make that did not make it into the film? Hannah, do you want to go ahead? Um, yeah, can do. Um, I think for me, it's sort of, it wouldn't, the, in making the film, um, certainly the, the parts I was involved in, it wasn't so much leaving out explicit research, it was more kind of narrowing down and not going down different paths um, that sort of opened up. So I, it didn't fit into the focus of the film, but I would like to look a lot more of about the different codes used in telegraphy and the kind of linguistic aspect of that. Um, so with the Marconi code and, and the map, I did explore that a little bit in a, a blog post, but I found it quite hard to, to find information about the Marconi code specifically. So I'd be quite interested in kind of codes in general, but also the spread of English in different parts of the world um, to do with telegraphy, not just focused on, on India. Um, so parts of Africa and uh, also like Australia and New Zealand, obviously are kind of even more primarily English speaking now than India. So that would be quite interesting to look at. I don't know if you'd like to add anything else. Yeah, so for, yeah, for me, it was basically, um, I think there were lots of interesting accounts in the Zodiac about uh, about just Britishers in, in India uh, and how they, you know, how, how they saw India from their lens. And that was really interesting. There were lots of pictures around, um, you know, so living in Mumbai myself, I saw lots of, you know, there's this gateway of India. There, there are lots of just uh, landscapes, landmarks like that. And when I saw pictures of those landmarks back in 1800s in, in the Zodiac, that was really, really fascinating for me just to draw that contrast between, between things. Um, 
and then definitely one thing that i would also like to personally explore more would have been uh, just this conflict of languages between the indian languages and the pakistan right so that is something that's that's really that's a really dynamic relationship uh, i think yeah full of just uh, yeah full of just lots of small nuances that is something uh, i think would have taken up a lot of time and did not necessarily fit into the realm of our personal our video for as such but yeah that's one thing i would have liked to explore more great well thank you so much and yeah thanks for the great questions um so before i pass over to gareth for any final questions we have a few in the in the q and a um, I would just like to say what a pleasure it has been to work on this project and how great it has been to get to know all of the students. And yeah, thank you so much for all the time that you've all put into this project. And yeah, it's just been amazing. And I'm just astounded at how wonderful all the projects are and hearing you all talk today has yeah, been really, really great. And I'd like to thank um, Alifa and Josh who have been technical support today and, for, and to Gareth and Anwar for your great presentations. And um, I'd also like to thank everyone at Porth now who helped make this project possible, um, including Charlotte, um, Alan and Sophie who all work in the archive here. Um, and so, yeah, I'd like to say good luck to all the students in the future on their work and hopefully we can all stay in touch and yeah if you're interested carry on some research at Port Kerno would be brilliant um but yeah over to Gareth for the final questions and we might run 10 minutes over I hope that's okay with everyone um yeah over to you Gareth okay thank you Alice um <clears throat> We've, we've had some excellent questions right through the whole session and uh, I think the and some excellent answers. I hope the whole symposium has been really most informative as far as I'm concerned and looking at what everyone is writing in the chat, it's been extremely impressive to all the people who are listening. And a good measure of, of that is that I think that we've only had about three participants who've had to leave early. So you managed to hold everyone's attention for a very long time. And I can assure you that having taught students <clears throat> for a very long time, hanging on to most of your class is quite a difficult thing to do when you've got a large class of students. So well done for doing that. Um, I think we've probably covered the detailed questions. Um, there's one thing which I think we could probably do um, now, which I'd like to do is that in um, one of the Q and A's, Alan Alan Renton finished off a, some comments with a co with a question: What is the best way to promote further remote access research projects? Now, it's too big a topic for us to debate now at this the last few minutes of this uh, symposium, but I think we at Port Kerno would certainly really welcome the views of all of you who've taken part and maybe if you have time just to write down your thoughts and how we could take this forward as a concept it really been uh, when i say it, it's an, an experiment in many ways for us to have gone along this route and um as i said at the beginning it came about out of necessity but it's actually been an absolutely brilliant exercise so if people could just a short paragraph and your thoughts as to how to take this forward, um, then I'm sure if you send those in to Alice, Alice can sort, sort them, uh, feed them through into Charlotte and Alan and Kay and get some um, ideas on how we can take this forward. So uh, the <coughs> what I'd like to do briefly now is the again thank a number of people but i i also want to mention i mentioned in my introduction that actually this engagement project was part of an arts council in england supported project to create a searchable online database of our collections and we've heard about the engagement part today um but i think it would, would be useful for everyone to know that the 
online database is nearing completion thanks to sterling efforts by Sophie <clears throat> in the um, archive. And I gather it will be accessible at, this, at the end of this year, and that will be accessible to anyone wherever you are. So that's going to be a big step forward for uh, uh, people who want to participate in similar projects in the future. Um, <clears throat> add to what Alice has said today, uh, thank you to all the students who have presented today. It's, it's hard work actually preparing these, particularly some of the films, and th what you've done to make it interesting to everyone is um, really impressive. Um, so, much appreciated. Um, thank you, Anwar, for your contribution today, and particularly for your contribution to the workshops. It's fairly clear from what students said today that they really appreciated those workshops and feel that it's been a very positive experience. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Alice said we kept online because of Aletha... Aletha Mays and Josh Deacon, who managed to, we did actually keep our fingers crossed that it was all going to work. And actually, we didn't have any disasters at all. I think it's really quite remarkable to be keep, able to keep going for, what have we been, three hours without a crash on any anyone's part. Um, the students from Exeter, well, we just have to say thank you to Exeter University for producing such a good group of students. So our links with Exeter are really building month by month, and we really appreciate the, the involvement. Um, thanks to Arts Council England for their support, um, because as we say it was a little bit of an experiment, but they, they've gone along with us on this, and uh, we've really found it to be a very worthwhile project. And finally, of course, Alice, you've been a star of the show on all, on this all the way along. And it's been great having you involved in, in leading the project. And thanks to, to Charlotte and the other team in the archive for their guidance during the whole project. I think it's, it's, it, this is going to be one of the projects that we're going to be pretty proud of at both Kernel. So I think we could draw the meeting to a close and we'll finish almost on time, Alice. So well done. So, um, so is that okay with you, Alice? Should we leave it there? Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Gareth. And yeah, I'd just like to say before we close that um, some of the students, so most of the students' work is now on Podcano website. Um, but there will be more added over the coming weeks and also shared on social media. And we've all met together. We've created a group film about the project, which will also be coming out in a few weeks' time, which will be great as a way to remember this project. So, yeah, thank you so much. And, yeah, thanks, Gary, for, um, yeah, for introducing and ending the symposium. Perfect. Thank you so much. Great. Good. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Take yeah. care. Bye. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.